right. So we'd like to call to order our curriculum committee meeting. It looks like everybody is in attendance from the committee. And uh, we just need a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, moving on. We do not have any public comments. And the first item on the agenda is uh, Tim and Amy will review this year's summer curriculum project request mm -hmm. with us. And not the textbooks. Some of, oh, I have, how about the textbook? And oh, the, I skipped textbook and instructional material requests first. To try to end this meeting quick. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Let's pass. I it scrolled on. down too fast. Yeah. Um, and some of the items will come back. This all, is, all of them. All this, of them this, is a, this, this is the first one. Okay, and first so just one. to kind of set the stage, this meeting, we have a lot of first look pieces that are for your information. And then we're going to come back next month uh, requesting action and then go to the board meeting in April on most of these items. Now, some of these you'll notice are placeholders where things have to still kind of come into focus. Um, and then the last item on the agenda today is uh, kind of a follow-up on our policy work from the fall around those curriculum and course guidelines. And Amy and I just wanted to provide you with a brief update of where we're at and how we're moving oh. towards implementation. So what you have here uh, are, are documents that come uh, from a process our teachers begin in the late fall. And so what happens is um, we have a process that where teachers go through their departments, we have a submission, we ask for these by um, late January. Now, sometimes there are things that we have to accommodate later, or we put them in and we have to kind of acknowledge some ambiguity around them and kind of come back and add more detail later. And then they come through uh, a review process in Amy's office and mine. Uh, which we're currently engaged in, then they will come to you. Well, actually, the, our review and your first look overlap. And then after our final review, they come to you at your next meeting, and then they'll go on to the full board. So this is both for textbook adoption. This is both a, uh, a process that serves a budgetary task. It also serves as your role in approving our main instructional materials. So one thing that will happen for you next month is the major, what we'd call like a major change. So for example, um, you know, what Maxwell has for AP European history, for example, we'll have a little write up kind of explaining you know, what that is, what the rationale is for um, proposing that. So you have a little bit of background for your approval decision. Now, in some cases, that's just going to be, this is the newest version of what's available. In other cases, this would be something new. So for example, if we look at the second item up there, uh, Todd Shuka um, would like for the ecology class to add grading sweetgrass as one of their reads. So that's a new book. We would have a little more explanation on that. That would not be a matter of just a, a new addition. Also, this is intended to be a pretty broad process. So some of the items on here, and this is more the budgetary uh, pathway than the approval pathway. You'll notice there's a lot of technology in here. So for example, ARC has a lot of technology requests. Those are things where Amy and I have been working with Rick Franz to determine are these pieces that are going to be out of the district C and I budget are these things that are coming from the district technology budget with mix area, or is there a third avenue where these are coming from? So just understand that this is a a pretty broad piece, and there's some things going through here as we just scroll down. Um, you know, well, you stop to... just for a second. Yeah, uh, sure, man. so like Lisa okay. Carruthers, mm -hmm. uh, it's a full segment of of books. Yes. And I tried to hit the link and I couldn't get it. And as a board member, those are the kind of things we start hearing stuff mm -hmm. about. And so without being able to see what it is, it's sort of, it'd be nice to know what it is or what the list is so that later on, if we hear something, we know something about it. 
And yeah, so, I wasn't. Uh, we will get you that probably later today. Okay, so so you can see what it is. Um, that's just an interesting question. So, Rebecca, just for curiosity, when you click on the tiny URL link there for Lisa's item, up, 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 up just a little bit. The next one up. Does it open for you? Uh, it's not letting me. Let me see if I can. So, so when it says see attached list, that's the one you couldn't open. Right? Under Lisa Carruthers. Yeah, that's it. That is it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, so we'll see. We'll, we'll see. Away, we'll see why it want to connect. Me. Yeah. So we'll we'll get that taken care of. But these are the books. We will get a um, a PDF of this. We can add this into board book after the fact. We'll also email it to the three of you okay. guys out that way. Um, but what what she is looking to do is for and this will also show up in the um, curriculum projects later on. Looking at Again, adjusting the modern lit course, because again, the goal of modern lit is to have no title in there that's copyright is older than the students taking the course. That's been kind of the goal of the course really? since its inception, right. you know, almost probably almost 20 years ago now. Um, and so it's pretty routine every few years we see some adjustments from Lisa, but it is one of the more active reading lists because of that focus on very recent literature. Thank so. you. If we could kind of come back here. Um, so again, I do want to highlight um, something here with the AP US history. Um, I want to point out this is a student soft cover. Um, and we discussed this last year, um, but I want to kind of bring it back because it was last year. You probably don't remember this conversation. Um, Jackson's goal here is to order the books and then have the students be able to purchase the books as a course fee so then they can freely annotate them. So we would buy these soft cover books on a reusable basis year to year. There'd be a course fee associated with a push. Students would keep them, students would annotate them. Um, and certainly if a student was on a fee waiver basis, we remove the cost to the student. But I just wanted to highlight that it's something we've done off and on in some of our courses, typically AP courses at the high school. Uh, and again, it's where the instructor sees value in the kids being able to get into the book and mark it up. Which if we're buying and holding the book, we obviously discourage them from writing the textbook. But we want to our AP courses uh, prescribe what books you have with them. Do we have leeway? Um, so. Yes and no. So let me kind of explain what that looks like. Uh, all AP courses go through what's called a course audit process. So AP has, and you can um, go and you can see, you know, from the college board, um, course outlines will run anywhere from 110 to maybe 200, 225 pages for courses. Very detailed about what the course is about. Then the college board provides AP teachers with what they would call some model syllabi. They're usually at least two per course. A few of the courses have more than two, but typically they're two. And so for your course to be approved by the AP to be taught at your high school, and this is different than taking kind of a, a one-off examination, but to offer an A push, um, every teacher, so this is a teacher thing, not a course thing, has to go through the AP course audit process. And Brian Borowski and I have to sign off and certify that we're gonna fully resource the course. They're gonna be taught as the college board intends from a resources standpoint, uh, that we provide professional development as needed to the instructor. Uh, and the instructor has to provide the syllabus for the college board. And so in principle, you could submit your own syllabus to College Board with your own set of readings, and it would go through an audit process and College Board would approve it if it met their standards. However, if you say, I'm going to follow Model A or Model B, it'll automatically be approved. So what I've seen over the years uh, is that with one or two exceptions, our teachers have always gone with a model course. 
Now, with a model course, um, there will be on that syllabus a, uh, a set of tests that are approved to use for that syllabus. So in principle, you could select any text you wanted for an AP course. AP would review that through the audit process, and if it met their standards, you could use it. In practice, however, people are ordering off a restricted menu uh, that's on the model syllabi. Because all the kids are then going to be taking an AP exam that's you know, either the school or their families are paying for that then has implications for college placement and in some cases even kind of a retrofit type of thing. So it's very important from the college board's perspective to make sure that the way the courses are being presented in the schools is consistent with the learning outcomes of the course as embodied in the exam. Okay. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to hear more about this, about the roles you're saying. You could if you... Well, is this a new course or an existing course? This is AP U.S. History. I thought it was a world history. So AP European History is above it. And that's... We've had AP European History on an every other year basis um, for a few years now. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, then we have some of the art pieces, which, um, again, these are, you know, a mix of things, ceramic drying racks, that's more of a building item, the technology, that might be more of an IT item or, you know, a classroom budget. In some cases, these are things that are actually fall within C&I. Those won't come to you on kind of your materials adoption piece, those are more budgetary items, but they show up in here because they are budgetary items that Amy and I have to work through with you. And you said this this is already within the budget we're going to approve, so it's not in, in addition to this. We know the expense of what's coming with the adoption. We do. So we have, we have a we have well. So I wouldn't say these are adoptions. When you see something like the art technology, mm -hmm. you know you're you're not saying we're adopting a ceramic drying rack, for example. We're buying it. But this is showing that there is an instructional need. We have budget lines for this. Now there are cases, and I. I don't want to say 100% now, but I think based on kind of our initial conversations, we believe our existing funding this year between art lines, Rick's lines, and maybe a few others, we'll be able to satisfy this. Um, going down, I do want to kind of highlight something that's going to be coming in next month. So um, as you know, we have a growing population of multi- Lingual learners. You heard Lisa and Pam's presentation to the last regular board meeting. Um, one thing that you will have coming to you as an action item next month, in all likelihood, will be two new course proposals. Uh, and, and normally you see those in the fall, those go in the course guidebook, um, and they're in course registration. But we do have two new courses as we've looked at our needs at the high school that we feel we need to bring in for next year. So you're going to, I just want to highlight these both in here and in the curriculum writing, because you'll look at these and you may be saying, well, I don't remember that we approved those courses and you haven't yet. So we're not asking you to approve any materials before you approve these courses. These courses will come to you next month, but one is a foundations of algebra course. And the foundations of algebra is a course for students who are new arrivals that have had, um, due to their previous education, they do not have the prerequisite skills and concepts to go into algebra at the ninth grade. And that is, um, with a few exceptions in special education, that is our lowest course in our high school. And, you know, in general, we feel our math program leading into the high school supports having algebra, our, algebra being our lowest course in the ninth grade. However, this is a unique population. And so we need to um, bring in a course to serve them because we found that placing students with this profile into algebra one um, usually does not lead to student success. So, and this is one where 
In fact, I'm meeting with um, Caitlin and Mark and Yelena Monday. Um, we're still in the process of determining whether we can use our existing materials, whether we need different materials. So you're not going to be asked to um, adopt an unknown foundations of algebra resource. We may in the end decide we don't need a new resource for this at all. We just need a different course using materials we have elsewhere in the district. But you know, if, if it looks a little unique, that's because of this. And there's another one, which is the bilingual biology that's in a similar situation that you may have noticed in the documents. And then we come into a lot of elementary pieces. I don't know, Amy, if there are any elements in here you want to highlight. Oh, sure. So um, our social studies curriculum is primarily delivered in our world language classes, but um, for quite a while, we've determined that Wisconsin history should be taught by the classroom teacher. And we're really looking for some new resources for this. So this is actually kind of a little like um, consumable like news magazine um, that we've been piloting this year that the teachers are really liking because it fits into their schedule because you know they have a lot of other responsibilities for teach, of course. Um, and it's it's engaging for the kids. So um I have one more meeting with the pilot teachers, but I think they'll recommend um, adopting it. So that's um, the elementary social studies piece. Um, for elementary ELA, there's uh, more detail that needs to be in um, those lines, but that is for bookroom purchases. Um, that's up on the schedule this year, and I um, have some new quotes and book lists that I'll populate um, with that. Um, the elementary bilingual program, they are wanting to build their libraries of uh, books in Spanish. And so we put a placeholder there um, for them to come do some research and find those texts um, for their um, classes. And then we are currently in a math review process. Uh, we're working with CISA 2 for that. And we are investigating um, six different resources that we're looking to winnow down to two. Um, and it, it used to be the case where publishers would provide a lot of those materials gratis, and that isn't always the case anymore. So we found when we did our writing um, pilot that one publisher did provide and one we had to purchase, and then we did actually sell those through our um, auction. So um, just in the event that we would need to purchase any pilot uh, materials, I put that placeholder there. Yeah, and I, I want to piggyback on what Amy shared. Um, you know, I'd say a change that really began around 20 years ago, but accelerated in the last 10 years, is we believe, at least for major components of our curriculum, that there is a lot of value in going through a structured pilot phase. So we will bring teams together to make sure we have a thorough grounding on what our goals are, what our vision for the content area is. Then very much like Amy's described here, they'll look at a range of resources and kind of winnow it down and come up with a pilot plan. So we would spend part of a year looking at those options before coming up with a recommendation. I would say our practice, which Amy and I feel is a sound practice, is increasingly uncommon in many districts where they will simply bring a team together look at some materials, not necessarily try them out in classrooms with students or engage a lot of teachers in the feedback process and then move to adoption. And so publishers no longer are viewing supporting the pilot process with free or low cost materials as part of the business model. Uh, so for districts that want to stick to a traditional pilot approach like us, we have some expenses and I should know um, just a little further up here, we also have reference to a middle school ELA possible pilot. We haven't begun that review process yet. We'll begin it later this spring um, and bring information to you once we, we have some uh, ideas about what our final pilot resources might be. So when you have expenses for this pilot and then you don't end up using that material, you said you resold it on the auction or something. So we recover yeah. some of this. I mean, a, portion. a little a portion. Yeah. Not, they don't get much for it. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, Mark, Mark, Mark I think, oh, had Mark, his hand sorry. up first. So, Amy first, Tim second. Yeah. So, in the past, this is going back maybe my first, second year on the board, uh, when there were some pilots, particularly math, we usually heard and had a presentation about them. So, first of all, I think the process is terrific that we do the pilots. I, I think it makes it. I think great sense, but does that does the pilot imply that we're looking at changing the direction of the program or using in math, or we're just looking at different resources to teach the same program? Well, um, I mean, I don't know that it would be drastic changes, but the Wisconsin standards were just revised in twenty twenty one. Everyday math has not had a significant revision um, maybe since 2016. They've done a few like copyright changes, but it hasn't been a significant revision. So um, while our students, you know, um, do very well in math, we have to make a lot of adjustments in order to meet those revised standards where the new set of resources would already be aligned. So I wouldn't say there would be big changes, but it would be um, probably more of a complete package that we wouldn't have to supplement as sure, much. For sure. And then what impact does that have, say on the intermediate school? I'm not sure what program they're using anymore. Yeah. I think but I thought it was everyday yeah, math, so but it made K, a difference. So you yeah, away K, from that. K4 is everyday math. Right. Five eight is go math. Okay. So um and one thing that um I know we we really like our um building and great configurations in Wanaki, but that is not how standards and textbooks divide at <laughs> grade levels. Mostly it's K-5. So it is a challenge when we're looking at curriculum to see if there's something that is K-8 or if we want to kind of partner intermediate more with middle school. Sure. So that's kind of a, a challenge sometimes. But right now we have everyday math and then go math. Okay. So we are doing this a very similar probably um, probably exactly yeah. the same process, uh, parallel process with 5-8. Um, but as you might remember, last year we reused Go Math for three years, so we have them kind of staggered out a year. So um, the K4 work team has been meeting with um, the CC2 consultant this year. They're going to decide and pilot um, next year. The 5-8 group is going to start meeting with uh, the consultant in April, and so they will be closely aligned. But if we found a K resource, that would be great. But if not, we're prepared to stick with that K four five okay. model. Okay. Yeah. And then the same thing at the middle school ELA is that looking at multiple different approaches or just reinforced materials. Or is that, I mean, that's not even known at this it, point. It's not even known, but I think, you know, just stepping back, um, we have not had a universal resource in a very long time at the middle school level at ELA. And, um, you know, kind of my assessment is that, um, again, as the standards update and as, you know, student needs evolve, I think it puts a lot on the teachers to be continually updating the resources. So there are some things for our local resources that you're going to see curriculum projects to do some work on because these pilots do take time to actually move to implementation. Um, but I do think it's a good time for us to explore what's out there for universal resources and um, look at some different candidates, maybe do some site visits. Um, and, and I, you know, I will say, you know, as as we're having this conversation you know it it might be of interest to you all for us to come in amy and me to pull something together in a few months just at a high level talking about what a piloting process looks like when we engage external consultants when we don't how we use some of the resources to become available to provide information about standards alignment just so you kind of understand in general how we approach these pieces and then you know as we have major um, pilots move forward. Um, 
you know, if you have an interest, we can certainly bring progress updates. So my question kind of piggybacks off of Mark's, but just, and I think I understand this, but just to get clarification, when when a textbook request appears on this document, it could be for a multitude of reasons. It could be the standards are changing. It could be maybe we're not, maybe we see like there's an area that we could improve on or we need to mm -hmm. um, add into maybe driven by data um, mm -hmm. outcome information. Or it could be that it's a, there's a cycle mm -hmm. of like we look at our social studies curriculum every five years mm -hmm. or something like that. And so then they're reviewing the curriculum and making decisions on what needs to be adjusted based on standards changes mm -hmm. and data and outcomes mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Yeah. So as Amy said, it sounds like the, the math pilot, we're going to be piloting math sounds like because standards are adjusting. Um, and how often do standards change? I, I guess my question is, how can we get like a better understanding of why, why a change would happen? Mm -hmm. um, and then we make the change and then how do we assess if that change was effective? Mm -hmm. If it's a measure, you know, like it, obviously the piloting program is, sounds like we're doing a really, good job with that. I like that idea too, as Mark said. Um, but if how, how do we assess that the change that we made is effective? Yeah, that's a great question. We can bring that in more depth, but I mean, I would say Wisconsin currently is on a seven-year cycle okay. for the standards. So okay. Wisconsin first enacted model academic standards in 1998. Okay. And then there was a long period where those standards were never revised. Um, when the Common Core came in um, in the 2009-2011 timeframe, that affected English, ELA, and mathematics. That was kind of the first big change. And then the state realized, you know, we should really have a process to update our standards. And so if you go to DPI's website, and we can provide you with that information, they kind of lay out what their cycle is and what their process is. So, you know, for mathematics, you know, as Amy said, we use a, we've used the same resource. It's gone through several editions since 1999. Um, it's worked well for us. Um, I, I would say that is um, much. Uh, much more on the semi-permanent side. Do you think that's fair, Amy, than you'd see in a lot of districts? Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, and so that resource had updated a few different times. And so part of it is the standards. Um, part of it is, you know, data. And then also, I think part of it is you want to avoid simply rolling up um, a resource from addition to addition, um, not unlike bus contracts, food service contracts. I mean, sometimes you roll them over, sometimes you do a more thorough review. And I think it's kind of a similar, similar piece for some of these areas. I mean, I think particularly at the elementary level, there needs to be some sensitivity to the fact that teachers, well, I'll let you. <laughs> yes, I, I, I can think I can finish your sentence. Um, you know, most of our elementary teachers teach um, three subjects, you know, science, ELA, which is reading, writing, speaking, listening, and math. And so we do have to be really thoughtful and strategic when we think about our materials adoptions for mm -hmm. elementary because yeah. of the training implementation piece there. So, um, you know, the, the social studies textbook requests they only teach social studies. They might teach that class multiple times. You know, it's easier for them to get up to speed with that set of materials, but we can't adopt, you know, new science and new right. math and new yeah, ELA in sense. short succession because of the, just the cognitive load of the teachers. And, you know, we want to make sure we're implementing it at, at a high level. So that's why we have to have those pieces kind of stay. 
So, so there's a there are a lot of factors that go into when an item ends up on this yes. list, for example. And this list, just this is just for my purposes. Yeah. So this list comes to the board in typically in February. Is mm -hmm. that right? Like this is the time of year kind of this list will come to right. the first look. Yeah. Yep. And um, okay. So when it comes back next month, okay. you'll actually have a memo from me and Amy on the titles that are actually adoptions. So you might see things like grading sweetgrass on the adoption memo. You will not see um, the art iPads on the adoption memo. That's just more of in here, so you have a sense of, you know, the the resource needs of our teachers. Yeah, and um, I mean, you talked about the various factors that go into requesting textbooks, but one of the main factors is the cycle. Mm -hmm. So elementary art is up this yes. year. So that's when they are kind of looking at, because they don't have like an art textbook, mm -hmm. right? So they're looking at their program and they're like, how can we enhance our program? Oh, with more technology or with this, you know, so that's why those requests appear here because, mm -hmm. you know, it was their turn yeah. to think about resources. Okay. Um, Thank you. We try to bring a lot of things together onto one document yes. here. And I, yeah. and I think internally it works well for us, but I realize you look at it and there's, um, you know, we're serving two different purposes here, and it's really good to have this conversation to kind of be clear about which is on the budgetary pathway, which is on the adoption pathway, mm -hmm. and where those overlap. Yeah. So, if we could just kind of scroll through a little more here with that doc. Um, you know, and so um, we anticipate this bottom line is going to be, you know, within what we can carry out. So what will happen next month is you're going to get the adoption memo on the new resources. Now, um, you know, a pilot resource is not an adoption, but we will let you know what the pilot resources are once we've settled on them. But as of today, they're not on here because we don't know yet. And it's possible, for example, that something like the foundations of algebra or um, you know, the bilingual biology, that may not be ready for April, in which case we'll bring that back to once we do have a recommendation. So that's these, any more questions about these for now? And again, we'll get you that, um, that link resource from Lisa to others about the model set. So if we could go back up and if we can go to the agenda and pull up the curriculum project requests. And you'll see some of these will be paralleling some of the um, resources requests. You know, so for example, we're just talking about um, modern lit. So you can see that Lisa and Kristen Thomason, who are two modern lit teachers, um, they're requesting some curriculum writing time with that adjustment. You can see the rationale in here as well. Um, and you'll just see a, a lot of things. Now, stepping back to the big picture, um, one thing we really have felt is a very useful feature in maintaining um, you know, good teacher engagement and maintaining an updated um, learning experience for our kids is the ability for teachers to request curriculum projects. Now, some of these are really guided by some of our priorities here, and some of these bubble up from teacher requests. One thing we saw with the pandemic is we had a few summers where we saw uh, just diminished levels of curriculum project requests. What we're seeing here is a full rebound in requests to pre-pandemic levels. So um, it, it's, it's great to see this level of activity picking up. So some of these are going to be, you know, the modern lit revision. And, um, you know, that is one type of project you might see. Um, in some cases, particularly at the high school and some of our classes, there has been an update in software 
And in those courses, the software is actually pretty integral to how the course is delivered. So you will see a curriculum writing request around that. Um, materials reviewed for pilots. If we're bringing people in the summer, we compensate them. That might be the piece that you see there. You'll also see some kind of uh, what I'd say um, more teacher generated pieces. So while we are looking at our middle school ELA materials, um, we're hoping to pilot next year. The earliest we could implement something new is 24, 25. The eighth grade team feels like they really need to work on their uh, expository and informational writing now. Uh, and so we feel that it's important to move forward with that while we also begin to look at piloting new materials, maybe implement a new universal resource um, in 24-25 or the year right after. Does this coincide with what you what we've talked about in the past about middle school pulling out writing um, to evaluate the student writing? You know, we talked about great, great question. So um, so yes, our 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 seven, eight, nine, and tenth grade English course teams have been subbed out for a day each this year to look at some samples of work. Um, okay. Seventh grade did it, eighth grade did it. They worked with Lynn Stenroos, ninth and tenth grade, okay. working with Mike Dreyer. So it's it's related a, to that. It's related, I mean, but this is an addition to that. That this isn't. It is, and I think the you know the other piece, okay. of course, that we've talked about is you know during the pandemic. Um, you know, there's a lot of instructional disruption. Our courses narrowed mm -hmm. to the essentials. Now that we have that well behind us, it's really important to reevaluate what the essential learning in the course is. And a high priority area for eighth grade ELA is the red. Yep. Okay. Um, what, can you explain what um, book rooms for the elementaries? What What is that? What's a book room? So that is a resource where we have uh, book sets for teachers to work with small groups of kids. And that is something that um, all teachers in the school use. I mean, it, it literally is a room filled with um, just packs of books. And so um, on the textbook adoption list, we have, a, we will have a lot of new texts for the book room. And so, in the past, we have funded some hours through summer curriculum writing just to help that leadership group at the site maintain that book room, especially if we're getting new texts. Just because it's hard to do it during the school year, you know, we want the texts ready to start the year. And so this, while it's not curriculum writing, it has been an avenue for us to support that. And how is a book room different than the library? So the library, while teachers can check out texts, of course, from the library, the library is mainly circulating books for student checkout. So students don't go into the book rooms. Um, so the teach it's a teacher resource, and there'll be usually like little bags or or boxes of like six texts that they would use to provide small group reading instruction. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh in a lot of worthy projects, but in reading through them, and just a question based upon what I heard at building level hearing sessions and just trying to get clarification. So one of the items appears to be for intermediate school teachers I don't know if it's fifth or sixth grade or both, but it's for 72 hours to uh, it looks like work with unpacking the standards and looking at how that affects the curriculum. Uh, that's one of the ELA mm -hmm. Uh, that starts with the Stacy Steering as one of his teachers. Mm -hmm. And so maybe I'm misunderstanding that, but in looking at that, it seems one or two of these are possibly unpacking the standards 
in comparing to what we're doing. And so the question is, it appears there are summer times to do this, at least at one of the buildings. And yet what I heard from K-4 staff is that they have to do the standard assessment and unpacking during their uh, during their PLC time. And so are, are those two different processes or, or are, yeah. are they the same and one's during the summer and one's during, during, during PLC? The way I read this one, it says, upon completing the standard revision, that's when it's about to be unpacking. So it's a little different, again, what I was talking about with elementary teachers having all of those right. disciplines. So the um, intermediate teachers have ELA and social studies right. or math and science. So this ELA group has probably been able to already do their unpacking during the PLC. Okay. So it says upon completing that, we will re-examine our curriculum. So it's my understanding that they've already done that. They should have already done that in their PLCs. We'll re-examine our curriculum units and um, consider if a new cur curriculum should be highlighted. So that's all right. All right. All right. Thanks. And again, if you look in here, um, Again, you'll see um, that heritage biology course. Here um, for elementary, you'll see some elementary work on the bilingual science too. And so um, you heard about this piece, the heritage biology course is actually a new high school course. So that'll be coming to you we anticipate next month. So it's in here, but you're gonna have to approve. Yep. From a sequencing standpoint, course gets approved, and in general, the major coursework comes after that. Now, the one exception in there is you will see for high school mathematics, um, there is a request to do some early study on AP pre-calculus. So one change the college board has made is they've created an AP course for pre-calculus, which they had not done before. Um, and so um, that's a pretty high stakes piece for the college transition. So the high school math team wants some time to, uh, and this would involve teachers from our FST course and our pre-calculus course to compare what our current courses are and the AP pre-calculus is this something that we want to do? And so this would probably be the one example of in anticipation. And I, I don't want, I want it understood. They may look at it and decide we AP pre-count isn't a good fit for us the way we sequence our mathematics. As compared to a lot of districts, um, we, we, in general, students move faster through their mathematics in the earlier grades but we spend more time on the advanced topics in the junior and senior year and to position our kids for, because most of our students, not all, but most of our students do go on to two or four year programs. And so it's, we have felt for some time, we would rather compact a bit in the early grades and spend more time on concepts in the junior and senior year to position kids for college. So it's a potentially, looking at what's in the AP pre -cal, we know we're different than the nation. We need to think very carefully about whether this is right for us, even though it's an AP course. I have a question with pathways. I'm not sure what that term defensible means in there. You're trying to make advance. Now, this is not AP. This is kind of the precursor to AP. Right. So um, if you were to look at our district, there are very few things that would look like what in other districts might be called an honors. Uh, however, uh, probably the closest thing we have to it would be our advanced sections of English in grades seven, eight, nine, and 10. And again, these are English courses. Pathways role here is really in supporting the English department in the selection process for these sections. But one selection thing, of kids or selection materials? Selection of students. Okay. However, Something that we have noticed 
Um, and by we, Janelle, and then Janelle and myself, and then we engage the English teacher in the conversation, is exactly what's described here in the paragraph, is that certainly kids can be placed into AE at different points. Um, you know, we have students who uh, may move into an AE section during the year. We may have students who are in AE that decide to step out. But in general, if you were to look at students in AE7 and follow that cohort through over four years to AE10, there'd be a lot of continuity. You know, some students would have come in, some students would have left. But what we've noticed is that each course has its own set of goals. And they're not bad goals, but if you look at the totality of the 710 experience, um, it doesn't necessarily articulate well as a four-year sequence of English experiences for kids. So uh, Janelle uh, and also Andy Mall, who's our pathway specialist for intermediate middle school, they have been engaged in a book study with our English teachers of the advanced sections, along with our instructional coaches, around some best practices in creating these types of differentiated courses. And so now having concluded the book study, now they're going to go and look at the actual courses. And so the reason we call it defensible, I, I think, you know, we could always bring Janelle and speak to this more, the AE teachers too, is if, if you're going to have an advanced English, English section, it's because you have students, and, and Mark, you can jump in at any point since um, you are the person who is probably, you know, one of, I think you were the driving force back in your time as chair to bring these in. There are times that despite teachers' best efforts, you can't differentiate to meet their needs in the regular classroom. And so the intention of the AE section is to provide that differentiation. If you're offering an AE section, you really need to make sure it's a different instructional experience that's really tailored to challenge those students, rather than we've just taken the top 10% by whatever criteria you want to identify them, and we put them into a different section. That's not the goal. The goal is find students who need additional challenge and provide something different than what they would get in English 7, 8, 9, or 10. And so the intent is to make sure we're living up to that. And I'll, anything you wanna just conceptually add to this, Mark? Well, it's hard because I, I don't know how it's evolved in the, yeah. since I left an old age, yeah. it's a long time, but, yeah, that was the intent. I would suggest in looking at um, gatekeeping, there's a limited criteria for actually getting in. At one point, it was strictly the gates McGinnity, mm -hmm. uh, a reading score. So, at a, based on your reading score, you had a cut, and anyone above it made it, anyone below it didn't. Um, did not preclude kids who didn't make the cut after their sophomore year from taking the advanced courses. Um, we added, I, if I recall correctly, uh, teacher recommendations as well as the Gates McGinnity. So we had a little bit more of a weighting. And because of that, it expanded from a singleton section to, to multiple sections. Um, but it was Clearly designed to be a higher challenging class um, to meet the needs of those particular students. And I say the one thing we've added in addition to that is we do have a student self nomination process. Um, and so if a student, um, and again, families can always self nominate too, but in recent years, we've added a student self nomination option, which has been utilized some at the high school where a student will feel like they could use something different than they're getting in their English 9 or English 10. And then, you know, we conduct the assessments, the, the, ninth, the teacher in their current class and the teacher in the section that they'd be going to will review some of their work products and come to a decision like that. So there is an opportunity for students to self-nominate as well. 
but that's the that's the why behind this request here. Any questions? Good discussion. So we'll bring this back next month. Um, I should say there is one item in here that has to do with a sensory room that will actually be something that Tiffany will cover out of the special ed budget. It's, it's in here because it was submitted by the form, but um, Tiffany and I have discussed that. It will be a special ed item. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so next item on the agenda is um, an update on the progress of implementing yes. the game guidelines. Yes. So we didn't highlight it, but if you notice back on the curriculum projects, there was a, a line for work on the elementary guides because we are going to work and um, you know, I think Amy can speak a bit to the vision on that. Elementary level, these courses cross three buildings, they involve lots of teachers. For middle school and high school, um, what we will do is make sure that every course syllabus is in Schoology. And then we're also going to have a checklist or some templates for what needs to be in the syllabus. We're not going to make everybody have exactly the same syllabus, but there's going to be minimum standard for what needs to be in a course syllabus. And so where we currently are at is our department chairs and system-wide um, in the last month have been reviewing um, what some of our uh, peer districts in the state, some of our benchmark districts have in this area uh, that they're providing their publics. And then at system-wide this month, we're going to be bringing in some examples of our what we currently have for documentation and have a discussion about what we're seeing with other districts, what the policy asks, what some of our current practices are to try to move towards creating these guidelines for the syllabi. And I, I think, you know, in general, most middle school and high school classes have a syllabus. So this is a tweak and not an overhaul, but getting to uniformity and making sure it's on Schoology for every course, it's gonna be a bit of work, but that's kind of our approach for that. The elementary curriculum guides are a little bit of a, a different thing because the scope is different. So Amy can speak to that. Yeah, so our vision for that would be um, grade level guides and include all the content areas and also um, get the information from the special um, really arts teachers too and having kind of a grade one curriculum guide rather than you know content like the secondary the same as you can. So just for clarification, um, as a parent or a student, okay. next fall, if I want to go see what I'm going to be studying in the first semester of biology at the high school, mm -hmm. I can go into Schoology, mm -hmm. and I will be able to see by teacher or by just freshman biology. Schoology is course based, yeah. Um, so it will it will be by teacher, but so for biology, you know, it will have a different teacher name on the top. Okay. And if there's kind of a biographical piece at the beginning, that's going to look different, but the units are going to be the same. Okay. Okay. And then for the elementary school, it'll be based on grade level. Okay. Yeah. So it's in process. I think um, when we get to kind of some of the those expectations for syllabi, we can bring those back as Samples of where we're headed. Thank you. Unless anybody has any questions, anything else to add? I think we um, just need a motion to adjourn unless we want to plan our. I want to. So, next meeting is going to be a big meeting. Okay. I'll, yeah. I'll just get that out there right now. <laughs> um, so, you're going to have those resource adoptions and curriculum projects coming back as action items, or at least for the pieces that are ready to be action items. You're going to have those, we anticipate those new course proposals for foundations in algebra and also the bilingual biology. The student achievement report, um, which you haven't seen um, since before the pandemic will be coming in next month. 
and we will probably with that bring in some of the additional requests that have been in around reading data at that next meeting so um so i think there's going to be a it's going to be a pretty meaty agenda we've been able to get through this in 60 minutes you may want to schedule a longer meeting yeah um can someone remind me when we have that schedule because we have it do we do do we have it pre-scheduled no, no i get I it mixed up we do. i get no. it mixed up with the um, policy, policy. <laughs> ready um i would suggest the first week and a half in april mm -hmm. is there a day and a time that works the best for timothy and we probably need to bring would you say tiffany no. i don't i don't think so um i think it'll i think it'll just be us okay so we could do um you know, I would say looking at good chunks of time. Um, and also trying to think about your committees. Um, the fifth Wednesday, I don't know how that looks mm -hmm. for you, Amy. Wednesday, the fifth, fifth or twelve. Could we do a Wednesday afternoon? A Wednesday afternoon works for you. You're open or you've got it scheduled? I'm sorry. Are you open then or you've got it no, scheduled? No, that's what I've, I've got that scheduled. Would you be able to do it late morning? Late morning, late morning. Well, or late afternoon, I need to have two hours. Oh, oh, that would work. So, yeah. so late morning, that okay. Or if we're looking at afternoons, we could Tuesday, Tuesday, afternoon. Tuesday, Tuesday the fourth would work. Yeah, yeah that would work. Tuesday the fourth in the afternoon. How does that look to you, Mark? Tuesday the fourth in the afternoon. That'd be perfect. Yeah, one o'clock or no late. Mm -hmm. That works great. Yeah. Okay. Good. But plan on one to three because <laughs> I, I mean, we we need <laughs> not to keep you for two hours, but. There'll be a lot, potentially a lot. There'll be action and there'll be information. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so looking down the road, April's not going to work, <clears throat> but um, uh, Colin, I mean, we had and concerns I have mm -hmm. is. How do we start scheduling time at this committee to become more informed on what we're doing with our K-12 reading program? Mm -hmm. um, there's multiple layers of that. I just got a you know, uh, saw an article in yesterday's uh, Milwaukee Journal where there could be some legislative pieces coming out with, within the next couple months. Mm -hmm. That would strongly affect what we do or don't do. Uh, I think to me it would be helpful to start understanding what we do do and how that kind of conforms to DPI recommendations, uh, science of reading, and and I'm not sure it, it, it's it's a huge thing. Mm -hmm. So is there a way to start thinking about how we can enlighten the the, the curriculum committee? On the what is and maybe the where we're the direction we're moving to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know there's some new pieces in that I was excited to hear about that, I, and a number of those things. I, I think just be helpful for the board to hear about, uh, at least at this level. I think that's a good word too to say become more informed. You know, right? I think we're doing a lot of really great things, um, and it's good to to know about them. So, I mean, I think um, if we clear, which we should, um, everything that's in our April agenda, um, I mean, the, the wrinkle in there is New York will be coming up 
and right. we'll, you know, but I do think, you know, we are not going to have, I mean, this month and next month, we have just uh, very similar to some of your fall meetings when new course proposals come through and some of the, um, the assessment report card data come through. Those are very, uh, you know, basically seasonal business types of periods. We are going to be entering um, what we might call an ordinary season in the calendar where we would have some flexibility to bring in more special topics. So maybe that's something, um, you know, Katie, it's been a little bit since you, Amy, and I had a chair meeting. I, I think the committee's interested in this. Maybe we can sit down together and work out a multi-month plan on this. Okay. Okay. You know, under, understanding that the committee may change, but right. if we wait on that, then this could get pushed back. Right. And I don't think we want to do that. Okay. okay. Does that work, Mark? I'm sorry. How does that kind of align with your request? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a long term uh, um, system process. And but to start you know, benchmarking time, I think would be really helpful. Okay. So that'd be great. Uh, the other question on that, I, in conjunction with things I read in the yesterday's state journal, mm -hmm. these public hearings pop up like five days in advance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So if there is a hearing on that, do you guys typically, are the schools informed at, at an administrative level that, so if there's gonna be a public hearing on this, let's just say a new law on reading, is there an alertness in the advance that goes in the newspapers so that if uh, someone from our district you know, administratively wants to be there to help share their perspectives, they have that opportunity or, are, are, are you guys in the dark as much as the public as you don't hear about it until you read it in the paper? So often the first we won't hear about it will be in the paper along with everybody else. Now, you know, you can, you can sign up for legislative notification services, but that does depend on how soon those calendars get updated by the legislature. And sometimes it is interesting how quickly things get scheduled. Yep. Uh, now, now, what will happen sometimes is, you know, we belong to professional associations. Mm -hmm. Our professional associations do have a government advocacy specialist, just like WASB has government advocacy specialists. So, WASB and the associations sometimes have go-to subject matter experts that when a topic comes up for a hearing, often because the government advocate, government advocacy specialists, or you might call them lobbyists, but they, they do more than what lobbyists might imply. They are in more regular communication with legislators and their staffs. And so if it's something that's really important to one of those associations, they may reach out to one of their subject matter experts and say, it's not noticed yet, but there will be a hearing coming up. Are you available to come help us with some testimony? Uh, but, you know, it's a big state and um, sometimes we have people that are called in to do that, sometimes not. So I didn't know about it until I read about it in the paper. Right. We, we knew that legislation was under discussion. Yeah. So there was similar legislation last, session and it was pat a version of that was passed through the legislature but it had requirements for schools and no funding attached to the requirements so the governor vetoed it um it'll be interesting to see if they can you know if the legislature marries some funding to the proposals where the governor's position is i don't know but i think what I saw in his veto message last session was it was due to here are these requirements and where's the funding coming to implement them. So okay. Thank I'm you. going to be interested to see what happens in those hearings, but yeah. you know, I'm not planning to be there and I you know. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we need a motion to adjourn. So oh. second. Over. Aye. Thank you. Katie, do you maybe want to get with oh, me and yeah. Amy and yeah. talk about getting that scheduled up?